Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel. Wherever you are in the world, so much love to each and every one of you. I truly hope you're doing remarkably well, that you're keeping lovely and warm. Summer's not too far away now, so you can get lovely and cosy and think about lovely hot summer days to come. But don't forget to get that lovely hot cup of cocoa because I've got a beautiful story for you tonight that you're just going to love. But before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Simon and I'm a park ranger working tirelessly at an exquisitely beautiful North American National Park. And I've been actively involved in this manner of work for many long years now. Every day has been a remarkable blessing and privilege for me. The best, most exciting and rewarding part of my job is meeting so many wonderful people from all walks of life, cultures, languages and religions from all over the globe. Granted, you do get weirdos, but on the whole, most of the people I meet on the job are really delightful with an ardent love and passion for nature and appreciation for wildlife. For me personally, I adore working out in the open with a fresh breeze blowing against my face or the sun beating upon my brow. I would describe the national park where I work as bedazzling and beguiling, as visitors from all over the world flock here to enjoy the scenic panoramic views, the majestic imposing mountains, the rugged rocky outcrops, the undulating green valleys, prairies filled with wild flowers in spring, dreamy green forests with statuesque trees, waterfalls, streams and silvery lakes. You name it, we have it all here, along with hiking trails, horse riding trails, camping sites and so much more. I will be keeping the details about where I work as obscure and indeterminate as possible, as one of the hardened, contemptuous rules of being a ranger is not to talk about various aspects of the job that must remain secret. There are very significant consequential reasons for doing so, of which I will not elaborate upon for obvious reasons. However, I will say that there are erroneous, enigmatic and inscrutable things that go on in our national parks that border on the bizarre and unconventional, so much so that many events remain cloaked in mystery and relegated to the realms of the paranormal or supernatural, as no explanation can be found to account for them. If my employers were to discern that I was speaking about some of these anomalous, outlandish events to you, and of course your listeners, I would more than likely lose my job and my job is my greatest passion, and so I'm not willing to risk losing it. Growing up as a young boy, I was a pastor's son, and it was assumed that I would follow in my parents' ostensible footsteps and become a pastor at their sizable church. It would seem that over three generations of my family had been men of the cloth, and from a young tender age, my zeal was not about the church, but all about the natural world. I remember raising some rambunctious, mischievous baby raccoons whose mother had tragically been run over and killed by a car. I would feed them every couple of hours diligently with a syringe until they became strong, healthy and robust enough to fend for themselves. I assure you they were quite a handful to raise, single-handedly, but I am glad to say they were successfully released back into the wild. I also rescued several gentle fawns over the years whose mothers had been killed by passing cars. Taking care of orphaned or abandoned animals brought me so much satisfaction and incredible joy. I can honestly say that every animal I ever rescued I bonded with on a very deep level. It was almost as if they sensed that their lives had actually been saved, and over the years I've actually received visits from these creatures that I rescued. I think what really clinched the deal for me as to becoming a park ranger was when my family visited Yellowstone National Park, and that was when I knew exactly what I wanted to do when I was older. I remember being so in awe and so enamoured by the park ranger who came to talk to my parents, and I was thinking to myself that he had the best job in the entire world, and I wanted to be exactly like him. I remember hearing my parents discussing me once. It appeared that my father was very aggrieved that I had so little interest in the church. I would hear my mother say, Don't worry, darling. We'll pray about it. I'm sure Simon will come around to our way of thinking sooner or later and follow in your footsteps. I'm not sure he will, said my father. I think he's completely enamoured about the idea of becoming a park ranger. I don't think we can stop him. God has clearly other ideas in mind for our son, and following in my footsteps is not one of them. 
And so it was one day that my fervent dream and desire was realised. I remember the first day I started working as a park ranger. I was young and naive at the time, and I could tell the senior park ranger had little regard for juniors like myself. He was looking at me very dismissively, as if he didn't think I would make it through a single day. But I knew he had underestimated how tenacious and motivated I was to make this my life's work. I'm saying how it is, son. I don't think you have the tough stomach you need for the job like this. I've seen many youngsters like yourself come and go, barely even lasting six months. There are things that go on here that are not for the faint-hearted, that defy natural explanation. You need nerves of steel in this line of work. It's not just about meeting people or helping them out to their campsites and trails, ensuring that they're well-maintained and safe. There are other things in the job that are far less agreeable. What do you mean, sir? I asked. You will find out soon enough, son, he assured me. And when you do, you'll be out of here faster than I can say grease lightning. I was more than a little determined to prove the senior ranger wrong, so I knew that whatever fate had aligned for me, I wasn't going to be one of those flaky young men who quitted my job at the first sign of trouble. I did ponder what it was that he was talking about, when he said that I needed nerves of steel. But I was in no doubt that I would soon find out. My first strange experience at the park happened when a couple of young female campers reported that there was a strange man loitering around their campsite that was making them feel very ill at ease. The two young women came rushing up to me when I pulled up to the site in my vehicle. They looked heartily relieved to see me and regarded me with large, frightened eyes. I could tell they were very discomposed and distressed. Someone's been spying on us in the tree line, they told me. We can tell that he's watching us, and it's freaking us out. I saw him, said one of the ladies. He went right into our tent. But the odd thing is I never saw him leave, but I did see him scuttling back into the woods. There's something not right about him. He was wearing blue jeans and a white T-shirt, and there was a blood stain on his shirt. He looked very creepy. You saw him go into your tent, but you never saw him leave, I said looking amazed. Are you sure about this? Very sure, said the woman. I don't understand why I never physically saw him leave, but he's no longer in our tent, but I definitely saw him walk in there. I'm certain about that. I'm very clear about what I actually saw. I immediately started to investigate the area, and I could sense something inauspicious was there, but I could see nothing. I instinctively knew that something predatory and evil was leering at me, and whatever it was, it felt menacing and menacious. But what can you do when you find nothing to account for these irrational feelings? It was incredibly disturbing for all involved in dealing with this questionable conundrum of which nothing made any sense at all. For indeed, the bodeful man causing this distress could not be located. I knew why these terrified girls were unduly alarmed, because I sensed something was incredibly wrong. But I couldn't make any sense of this illogical, nonsensical course of events upon which there was no explanation. I've always been a rational person at the best of times, and has believed that there is an explanation for absolutely everything. But on this occasion I was drawing blanks, and was nonplussed and perplexed. I walked around the grove and could clearly hear the squeaking sound of heavy feet walking behind me at a steady pace, and when I stopped, so did they. I could even smell the acrid stench of alcoholic breath being breathed over me from a distance away. But when I turned around, nothing was there, and this experience rarely rattled me, because I sensed a very tangible, haunting presence. Who is there? I said, looking around the wood green with my flashlight. Show yourself now. But there was nothing. I was met by the sound of silence, and only the soft rustling of a few leaves, and the gentle breeze blowing against my face. Who is there? I commanded. Show yourself now or else you will be in serious trouble. All of a sudden, something was tapping me on the shoulder, and I turned around, but no one was there. Imagine my amazement. I was completely freaked out. Nothing made any sense at all. What in God's name was going on? Suddenly, one of the girls came running forwards towards me, with a distraught look upon her face, and she was out of breath. He's back, she cried in distress. He went right into our tent again, she said. He's there right now, and we can hear him going through our things. 
Please come quickly. I immediately raced over to the tent and cocked up my rifle because I wasn't sure whether we were dealing with a delusional nutcase or a drunken vagrant. Sir, I commanded, come out of the tent now. There was no answer, and the two young men looked at me with anxious faces. I peered into the tent, but no one was there. The tent looked as if it had been ransacked by a huge tornado, as it looked like a jumble sale in there, with clothes strewn all over the place haphazardly. But I thought to myself that maybe the two girls were just exceedingly messy. No one is in there, I told the young girls, who began to shriek when they looked into the tent. We both saw the man walking into our tent, they said. Look, the place is in complete disarray, and our clothes are strewn everywhere. He has completely ravaged our tent. The place looks like a bomb has hit it. Just check that there's nothing missing, I told them. I'm only missing my yellow sweater, said the girl. The two girls were absolutely terrified. They kept looking at me for the answers and solutions to their problem. As if I was somehow the one who could save them from this inexplicable situation. I was at my wit's end as to know what I should do about the strange goings-on. I didn't know how to console the poor women who were in a desperate state. I decided to help them hitch their tent in another location, and it would seem that the troubles that they had dissipated, and I was heartily relieved about that. I did check on them, though, all night, which was very reassuring for them. I returned to their original campsite to see if I could get a sighting of the weird man. But although I sensed the same disturbing, unsettling energy, I saw and heard nothing. I did find the yellow jumper that the girl was missing shredded into pieces and hanging like tinsel all over a large fir tree. All of a sudden I felt this awful throbbing pain searing through my flesh on my torso region, as if someone had deliberately slit my skin with sharp nails. And then there was a faint whisper in my ear and a husky, disembodied voice that said, GET OUT! I was so terrified that I just legged it out of there, and I knew in that moment that I had encountered something supernatural, and not of this world. I was to discover that I had three long, bleeding scratches along my torso, and I was so frightened by this event, but I never told the other rangers about my experience, most particularly the senior ranger, who was expecting me to call it quits any day now and I was not going to give him the satisfaction of letting him see me fall. I didn't want any of them to think that I was going to lose my bottle. On another occasion, I was called out by a frantic woman who was crying inconsolably on the telephone, so I made my way to her location because I couldn't make out anything she was saying on the call. The woman was sobbing. I watched a man on that rocky ridge over there deliberately jump to his death, she cried. I think he fell down. I could hear his body crashing to the ground. I couldn't go over there to look. I just haven't got the stomach for it, she told me. I'm too terrified of what I might see. I'm certain his body must be all mangled and messed up after such a ghastly fall. There's no way you could survive that. Of course, I said, trying to calm the poor lady down. Just you relax and take it easy, I said, trying to compose the very distressed woman. I remember my body muscles tightened and clenched, and a feeling of impending dread overtook me. I cautiously ambled over to the rocky ridge, psyching myself up for what I was about to see. I knew I was qualified and prepped for a scene of carnage like this with blood and guts invariably spilt all over the ground. I had received intricate training about coping with this kind of situation, an off-the-cuff premeditated scenario as there are people who commit suicide all the time by jumping off ridges, and people who accidentally fall off the mountains to their deaths. So now everything that I'd learnt, all my training was being called into play and put to the test. And when you're faced with the grim reality of an actual event, I can assure you that one is never fully prepared for dealing with these horrendous nightmare scenarios. Well, at least I wasn't. Imagine my surprise when there were no bodily remains lying there on the ground. "'Are you sure you saw someone jump?' I asked the lady. "'Very sure,' she said. "'I even heard the body crash to the ground and the sounds of bones breaking. "'I cannot forget a sound like that. "'It sent chills down my spine. "'Well, ma'am, there's nothing there,' I assured her. "'I'm not making it up,' she insisted. "'The woman looked very bewildered. "'I know what I saw.' I remember he looked directly at me before he jumped, and I sensed a sadness. I could feel it. I promise you it was real. The distressed, frantic woman began to search the area with me, 
but there was no sign of the suicidal man, and I remember her saying to me, I know what I saw, I know what I saw, I don't understand. I know it sounds strange, but I actually believe the woman's account, because there was an oppressive feeling in that area, unlike anything I've sensed before or since. It was a wretched, hopeless feeling of despair that seemed imprinted on this place like a signature in time that could never be distinguished or erased. And many people who have been around the area claim that the spot gives them the chills to this very day. It was a year later that I actually witnessed that very same man walking across the ridge and jumping over the edge to his death. I recall feeling the depths of his pain and total despair. I cried out to him, Stop! Don't jump! I told him not to jump, although I knew I was seeing only his ghost and the traumatic event in time that was being reenacted again and again in our reality, rather like a video recorder being played over and over. As strange as it sounds, I was hoping that I could stop him from jumping, but my efforts were obviously fruitless. I could hear his body crashing violently to the ground and his bones breaking, but I saw nothing. I did go over to the place that he must have landed, patting the ground with my hands, and believe it or not, there was a spot on the ground that was so icy cold, it actually felt like I was handling a block of ice, and the rest of the ground on the outer perimeters was warm to the touch. We have had over a dozen visitors since, at the park, phoning in about a suicide jumper jumping to his death, and we always tell them we'll attend to the case immediately, but we know it's just a ghost. On one occasion I got a frantic, panic-stricken call from a woman at her campsite as she informed me that her five-year-old nephew had vanished and she was in a dreadful state. The hysterical, distraught woman was weeping so much that her mascara was running down her face in black streaks and she was blubbing incoherently. I could barely distinguish an audible word that she was saying. Ma'am, I said, please try and compose yourself. How can I possibly help you if I can't hear a word you're saying? Take a deep breath, relax, and tell me exactly what happened. She'll never forgive me, cried the woman. This is the very first time my sister's trusted me to look after her kid, and now he's missing. Something so terrible has happened. I feel it in my guts. Could you tell me exactly what happened, ma'am, and where your nephew was the last time you saw him? Callan was standing behind the oak tree and was answering a call of nature, I told him to be quick about it, uh, but after a few minutes I called him again, and he'd completely vanished. He was there, and now he's gone. I don't understand what's happened, she said. It's like he vanished into thin air. It all happened so quickly. Look, I said, he may have wandered off, but I'll call on extra resources, and I'll leave no stone unturned to check every area for your nephew. We'll do our level best to find him, I assured her. Why did this have to happen, cried the woman. My sister will never, ever forgive me. I've been in prison for over a year, and my sister has only just started to believe that maybe I'm not a complete deadbeat loser that she thinks I am. We've only just begun to fix and repair our relationship. We never spoke to each other for over ten long years, and now this had to happen. She'll never speak to me again, never. Look, I said, calm down. We'll only inform her if the child is definitely lost. At this stage, we don't know what our situation is. She need never know about this if we find him. Now keep praying. Could you just tell me exactly what he was wearing, ma'am? It was an electric blue T-shirt and a pair of khaki pants. Before long, a search began trying to locate the young toddler who'd been missing for a long while. I was galloping over the wilderness on my horse Ladybug through the verdant forest area that was in close proximity to the mother's campsite, when I suddenly saw something blue catch my eye, suspended up in a large tree. My heart almost flipped in my stomach because I didn't know what I was going to see. Was this the missing boy, I wondered? I bounced off my horse and sprinted towards the tree, alerting all my colleagues to my findings. I found the boy, I said. He's up the tree, but he's not responding to my calls. Cullen, I said, are you all right? I could see the blue t-shirt and the khaki pants in the tree on a high branch, so I knew it was the boy. Cullen, can you hear me? Are you all right? The boy did not move, 
nor did he respond to my calls. I assure you, there is no worst feeling in the entire world, believing that you are dealing with the recovery of a dead body, especially when it's that of a very young child. I could feel the bitter taste of nausea rising up in the back of my throat, as I pondered on what sick bastard had done this to the poor child. In a trice, backup arrived. Someone climbed up the tree to retrieve the boy. But when they brought him down, it was not the boy. We discovered someone had made a hay doll and put the boy's clothes over it and stuffed it up in the tree. This had to be one of the sickest, most insidious things I've ever witnessed in my life. I knew we were dealing with someone who wasn't right in the head, and time was of the essence if we were able to retrieve the child alive. My emotions were very mixed at this point. I was relieved that the boy was clearly not dead, but vexed as to what had happened to him. Also, I ascertained that the boy could potentially be still in very grave danger. If we didn't act fast, we may be dealing with a missing persons case that could never be solved, or the final recovery of a dead body, or a body that was never ever found. Whatever way you looked at it, things didn't look good, and the whole case left me with a nasty taste in my mouth and a dreadful vacuous feeling of hopelessness. It was confirmed by the overwrought woman that those clothes were indeed what the child had been wearing before he'd mysteriously vanished, and I had to inform her that the parents would need to be notified at once. Once again I went galloping over the immediate area with its undulating green turf, rugged outcrops and vast areas of natural greenwood. That was when I saw this dark shadowy creature moving towards me as it seemingly floated with such a fluid grace, with a small bundle contained in her large human-like hands. I was so stunned and gobsmacked by what I was seeing, it seemed so surreal, because running towards me, not away from me as you would expect, was the elusive, evasive and reticent creature that we like to call Bigfoot, that would not normally want to be seen by anyone, and prefers to remain in the shadows. Yet this critter was waving me down with her overlong arms, determined to get my attention. Over the years, working at the National Forest, I have heard of people who claim to have had encounters and brief sightings of Bigfoot, including park rangers that I know in person. But for me personally, I had to physically see one to believe that the critter was indeed real, because I'm a natural and born sceptic. Yet what I was observing right now in my field of vision, without a shadow of a doubt, was a majestic, lofty female Bigfoot, but it was her determination to pursue me that baffled me the most, and she was sprinting towards me with a child in her arms, whom I realised at once was the missing boy that we were looking for. The Bigfoot pointed towards the boy and pushed him towards me very gently, looking directly at me with earnest eyes and making a strange chattering sound. I watched in stupefied silence, hardly daring to believe what I was actually seeing. I stood there like a statue, frozen to the spot, not by fear, but by wondrous awe, as I watched this powerful creature gliding away, never once looking back. This all happened within seconds, as that is how fast it was. For me, it was extraordinary. All I remember was that she was about seven foot, six hundred pounds, with short legs and very long arms, V-shaped muscular torso, and a pyramid-shaped head, with deep-set, beautiful eyes that were filled with love and compassion. This Bigfoot was so human-like and intelligent, I was completely overawed by her. I immediately radioed in the ranger's office to say that the kid had been found safe and sound, and I could hear the relieved voices on the end of the line. Everybody was so happy. Are you Cullen? I asked the boy. The kid nodded. I discerned that he seemed very unfrazed and undaunted by what had just transpired. He was wearing a strange one-piece outfit, made of the oddest shimmering white material that I've ever seen. In truth, it was a strange fabric that seemed so out-of-worldly, like something that you'd expect to see on Star Trek. Where did you get to? I asked him. Your aunt has been very worried about you, and everybody has been looking for you. The lady took me, he said. You mean the hairy lady that brought you here? I asked, referring to the Bigfoot. No, not her, another lady. A pretty lady with long red hair. Where did she take you? I don't remember, but it was nice. She was nice to me. Did she give you the clothes you're wearing? Yes, he said. And then what happened, I asked. Well, she took me to another lady, and the other lady says I wasn't the right boy. I see, I said. And what happened next? 
I can't remember, but then the hairy lady with the funny face you saw brought me when she saw me under the tree. She brought me to you. That's all I remember. To cut a long story short, the child's aunt was so relieved to get her nephew back, and it was very fortunate for her that the ranger's office had not managed to contact the boy's mother, and so she was none the wiser about what had happened to her son. I gave you the wrong number, the aunt told me in confidence. You have no idea what my relationship with my sister means to me. I just wanted you to search for the boy a little longer, before she received the terrible news about her missing son. Fast forward a few weeks, and the aunt phoned me out of the blue one day. I still have no idea what happened to my nephew, she informed me, but I'm beginning to think something out of worldly happened to him. Nothing makes any sense to me at all. I keep thinking he might have been taken by aliens or to a parallel universe. It's all exceedingly odd. I took the fabric of his, the onesie that he was wearing, to the dressmaker, and she's never seen a fabric like that before. I can honestly say the aunt's phone call left me with more questions than answers about the strange things that go on in our national parks. I do, of course, have other stories to share with you and your listeners another time, perhaps. But until next time, this is my story. Thank you so much for that incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night.